it is the interpretation we use for all practical calculations. How to think about it more deeply is a different question. And I think because of the split in the Copenhagen interpretation between the thing we study and the observer himself, that it can't survive in a fundamental sense. One has to remember that before Bohr did this work, uh, there was a sense of mystery about quantum mechanics. Nobody really knew how to use the results of, say, calculating the wave function to make predictions about experiments. With the Copenhagen interpretation, we have a way of using calculations to make predictions that we could all agree on. The philosophical understanding of it is probably not satisfactory. Bohr thought that ob observers, scientists, measuring apparatus have to be treated by the old Newtonian methods of classical physics, whereas electrons and atoms and so on would be treated by quantum mechanics. Uh, and that's, I think, the way we do think about it from a practical point of view, uh, because after all, f measuring apparatus and physicists are big compared to atoms, and they are well described by the laws of Newtonian mechanics. From a fundamental point of view, we can't accept this kind of dualism, that there is on one hand quantum mechanics for the electron and classical mechanics for us. It's got to be the same physics for, every, for everything, and presumably that physics is quantum mechanics. Sometime you decide to measure this one and you find it's in a spin-down state. You immediately know that the other one is in a spin-up state. Now this is what bothered Einstein, because that object that was going off like this must have had an, what he called an element of reality. The spin must have been in some state. It didn't develop a certain state simply because you measured this, but in fact it did. It develops that state because you measured this one, so you have a sort of an instantaneous action at a distance, which was very unsettling. I 1957 redigerede fysikeren Bryce DeWitt et særnummer fra en fysikkonference. Han fik en anmodning fra den kendte amerikanske fysiker John Wheeler vedrørende en af hans elever, Hugh Everett. When I received it, I was simultaneously shocked and delighted. I was delighted because it was the first new idea on quantum theory that had been published or had been written up in years. Hugh Everett fremlagde en helt ny alternativ fortolkning af kvantefysikken, mangeverdens fortolkningen. I dobbeltspalte eksperimentet beskriver Schrödingers linje, at der er mange muligheder for hvor elektronen vil registreres. En af mulighederne vil så realiseres som en prik. Men hvad nu? foreslog Everett, hvis alle de andre muligheder også samtidig realiseres. Everett havde en drastisk konklusion herpå. Det foregår blot i andre verdener. The paper was published, and then there was total silence. Here was this young man who had interjected a brand new idea into quantum mechanics, and he was being totally ignored. And I felt that this young man had not gotten his proper recognition. So I resolved to correct the situation. I wrote a popular account for Physics Today, which appeared in 1970. And after that, Everett could no longer be ignored. Da Bryce DeWitt i 1957 havde besluttet at offentliggøre Everett's artikel, skrev han til Everett om sine betænkeligheder. I just couldn't swallow it because it implied that I split. 
and I don't feel myself split. So he added a footnote to his paper in which he said, that is like the anti-Copernicans in the time of Galileo who didn't feel the earth move. The point is that the theory in both cases tells you precisely what, that you will not feel it. In the quick case of quantum mechanics, you will not feel yourself split. In the case of classical mechanics, you will not feel the earth move. My own view is that for the present, we're stuck with the many worlds interpretation of quantum mechanics. Uh, we don't have anything better. Uh, it may be that we will find some way of becoming comfortable with it. I'm not comfortable with it. Uh, or it may be that quantum mechanics will change in some way. I mean that the theory, not just the interpretation, but the theory itself will turn out to be a little different. Unfortunately, it's very hard to imagine a theory which is close to quantum mechanics. We, we know that any new theory would have to be very, very similar to quantum mechanics because quantum mechanics works so well. So the corrections must be small. It's very hard to find a theory which is nearly quantum mechanics but not as, is not exactly quantum mechanics. I've tried and I haven't succeeded in doing that. They say that it violates the pr Occam's principle of Occam's razor, that, that scientists should always keep entities to a minimum, and that it is ridiculous to ascribe reality to worlds of which you cannot be aware. Well, if you take this argument seriously, then you are not allowed to ascribe reality to planets in distant galaxies. Now, someday, maybe both those planets and the many worlds will become observable, at least indirectly. I, I always like to say that it's always valuable to push any formalism to its extreme logical conclusions. This has been shown over and over again. Uh, Maxwell's electromagnetic theory, Einstein's relativity theory, quantum field theory. You know, in the 19th century, there were many physicists who didn't believe in the reality of atoms. So, <laughs> it's not wise to, to ignore what the formalism is trying to tell you.